Let me get to the second clip here where uh, he goes on. And then on top of it, you're caught up in a system in which the employer has every incentive and every interest to squeeze the part that's paid to you, thereby increasing what's left over for him in what you produce. Get more out of you, give less to you. It's endless, isn't it? Get you to do a little task extra. Get you to go quicker to the bathroom. Yeah, so God forbid we increase, we increase productivity. Uh, God forbid we increase productivity. God forbid we, 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 we do things faster. God forbid we... Yeah, that's how you get paid more. Because the fact is that as you become more productive, you get paid a higher wage. Because that do it faster makes you more productive. And if you learn how to do it faster, there's more competition. There's more, there's more people who will hire you. Right? So, he resents the fact. And, and imagine now if the workers, this were democratized. You got to choose all these things. Then what is the incentive to make it faster? What is the incentive to make it better? What is the incentive to work a little harder? Are we going to vote on that? Who's going to vote on that? Really? Is it going to be voted on? No. It's not going to be voted on. Nobody's going to vote majority-wise, to work harder, to work faster. Or as he says in a minute, let's see. Oops. Make sure you come on time and don't come on leave time. God early. Forbid. Come on time and don't leave Get early. the picture? <laughs> always, always. And if there's a machine that can make you more productive or make you unnecessary, oh boy. Well then let's not have machines. Let's not have machines. Machines. Now, imagine if that were the attitude at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Then there is no Industrial Revolution. Let's not have machines that make us more productive, because then some of us might lose jobs, and, you know, we'll have to work with a machine. I don't like machines. I don't want to work with a machine. No innovation, no forward progress. We're all back to being subsistence farming. Marxism is the economic ideology that drives us to all be subsistence farmers. It goes backwards. It undoes capitalism and works us backwards towards a world in which we have nothing. Nothing. That's the goal. That's, you know, that's their purpose. Their purpose is destruction. All right. All right. Um, let's see. Keep going. Aged quickly. Impact on you? Who cares? You. What's the impact on you if you don't use the machine and your productivity goes down? The only reason wages have gone up over the last two hundred years is because productivity has gone up. The only reason we have a middle class, we have all these people who is so wealthy that we have a, such a high standard of living is because of increases in productivity. And yet he is laughing at it, mocking it. I mean, the hatred spewing from this guy is truly that. Spend the best qualify. days and the best hours of your adult life in an institution that tells you in a thousand ways, I don't give a shit about you. In capitalism, of course, you are, as Marx loved to say, free. And here's what the freedom means. You can leave the employer and go find another one. Or you can go start your own business. Or you can go back to the farm and grow your own food. You can do a lot of different things. What freedom actually means is the lack of coercion. Nobody's coercing you. You can go back to your ancestral farm. You can go and start a business. You can starve. Or you can choose your job. But they again assume that stuff is just there, resources are just there, and we all have equal rights to them because they're not created by anybody. 
And then we should just get our fair share. And we should just be allowed to all be roaming around the world naked, you know, and just access resources wherever we need them. I mean, it's just such garbage, such nonsense. Freedom from want. Freedom from everything. But of course, the majority, the one freedom you don't have is freedom from coercion. Because freedom from coercion, what if the majority decides to coerce you, to tax you, to lower your wages, to fire you? What if the majority decides to take your stuff, to steal your innovation? Then it's fine. Then it's okay. Then there's no problem. Hoping against hope that the other one won't treat you as nastily as the one you... Now, note, Left did. employers Along. are all nasty. They treat you with nastiness. Is that your experience? Is the mic level off the charts for real? Am I really, really loud? All right, we can adjust that. Is that, hopefully, that's better, all right? Tell, let me know if that's better. Um, really? Is that your experience with work? I mean, if it is your experience with work, then you should... You should, you know, find a different job. I mean, this is why well, I always recommend people go listen to uh, Steve Jobs' uh, commencement address to students at Stanford because, you know, he says that follow your passion, love what you do, go do something you really, really, really love. If you hate your job, find another job. If you're really treated like garbage by your employer you shouldn't be working there and i know it's hard to leave a job i know it's risky but really so he's louder than i am right let me let me just uh let me let me get the volume right here ah this doesn't work that well oh wait I mean, remember, at the end of the day, Marx's utopia is, is truly of that naked savage. Marx's utopia is everything is just available. It, 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 we can all do whatever we want to do, whatever we feel like doing, whatever we have a passion to do. And everything that we need is just there. It's just available. And we, we don't need to be, we don't need money because stuff is just there. You don't need to buy it. It's just available. And we all produce because we love producing. And we don't work for one another because we can all produce the stuff ourselves. We've reached such a level of ability. It's such a science fiction detached from reality, unhuman system that he projects. And he never explains, never explains in his books how we get there. How do you go from where we are today to there? There's a workers' revolution. There's, by the way, a worker's dictatorship. There's the dictatorship of the proletarian. And then somehow, through this dictatorship of the proletarian, we evolve into this utopia. But the fact is that the dictatorships of the proletarian so far experienced in the history of the world have resulted in over 100 million people dead. That's what it's resulted in. So don't give me this nonsense, this pretense that there is some utopian system. Capitalism is an amazing system. And if you're not happy with your job, if you're not happy with the work that you do, if you're not happy doing what you're doing, do something else. Take moral responsibility over your life. Be brave. Have courage. Have a backbone. Take some risk. God. <laughs> and a very constricted notion of what freedom means. Yeah, watch <laughs> this. Wolf lays it out. Now, I want to go a little bit into the, the profit motive aspect of all this because profits that these companies make, these, these massive companies, they don't benefit the employees of these companies. I mean, you'd think if your labor is producing the company... They don't benefit the employees? They make 
the jobs of the employees possible. There are no jobs without profit. Profit makes the jobs possible. There are no jobs without an entrepreneur, without capitalists, without profit. Right? Somebody says, I'm telling you to learn to code. No, I'm telling you to go and enjoy the work that you do. Lots and lots of money, lots and lots of profit. Shouldn't that benefit you? Doesn't that mean that your it labor does benefit helps you. to... You spend the best days and the best hours of your adult Sorry. life in an institution it's not going that well today. I don't know why it's so. Uh... The employees of these companies. I mean, you'd think if your labor is producing the company lots and lots of money, lots and lots of profit, shouldn't that benefit you? Doesn't that mean that your labor helped to create that? It helps to create it, and it does benefit you. You get a job, you get a salary. Maybe you have a profit-sharing plan. Maybe you own some stock. Maybe you have a pension that owns the stock. But yeah, it benefits you directly. But that's not what happens. All you have to do is read that's the headlines every week. I mean, you had GM close five plants, laid off 14,000 people. So... Oh, I guess that means GM was doing terrible, right? No. GM made $2.5 billion in profit the previous quarter. $2.5 billion in profit in the previous quarter. The next quarter, they close five plants, lay off 14,000 people. Where are the benefits going to? The top, obviously, they spent 295 times more than the average GM worker makes on CEO pay alone. $22 million. The CEO makes $22 million, 295 times more than the average GM. But the reason is that the CEO produces 295 times more. It's almost impossible to find a CEO who can manage a business like that. And if he manages it badly, if he's not a good, if he's not a good CEO, what happens to all those workers? They all lose their jobs. They all lose their jobs. So you better get a good CEO. Because without a good CEO, you guys don't have jobs. You really don't. CEOs, I mean, there's no appreciation for what a CEO does. The extent of the skill needed, the extent of the responsibility. I mean, all those jobs are up to him doing a good job. When the CEO of GM doesn't do a good job, which he often doesn't, people lose their jobs. People are fired. And that's not good for anybody. All right. Let's see what else he has to say. That's where the money goes. They spent $14 billion on stock buybacks. To artificially inflate their own stock. No, received $3.29 billion in taxpayer funded bailout money in 2008. This is a company living off of taxpayers. All right, this thing won't mute. And where does all their money? All right, so bailouts, you know I'm against bailouts. Of course, they shouldn't have gotten bailout. But, but, stock buybacks? Stock buybacks don't artificially inflate stock prices. They do not artificially inflate stock prices. When you buy back a stock, in a sense, you're returning capital to your stockholders for them to invest somewhere else, which creates more jobs elsewhere. It's a net benefit to the economy. And basically what you're saying when you do a stock buyback as a company is you're saying, this money is better in your hands. You have better investment opportunities than I do. Because if I invest it, I'm not going to get a good rate of return. There are just no opportunities for me and my business to invest this money. So I'm giving it to you, my investors, to go and invest it in something that can return a higher rate of return. And by doing so, they will be allocating money to businesses that have the potential to hire more people to grow, to innovate, and to produce a higher standard of living. All right, I'm going to 
I mean, the whole, these people really, I mean, and I'm not saying this, um, they just have no, no understanding of economics, of finance, of business, of how a company runs, of how a company is managed, of what a stock market is, and what a stock is, and how a stock is priced, and what happens when you buy back your stock. They have no idea of finance theory, economic theory, any of it. Basic stuff, basic finance, basic economics. They are completely and utterly ignorant of all of it. So David says, but, but wait a minute, you're on there. must push stock prices up when you buy back the stock. Well, let's think this through. So I have a billion dollars of cash, right? And I use that billion to buy the stock. Now, you would say the stock goes up because there's increased demand for the stock. But how long does it stay up? Because when I owned the stock before the buyback, I had... I owned, in a sense, uh, let's say I own 10% of the stock of a company, to make it simple. I own 10% of the stock of a company. I own all its assets, all its future cash flows, and a billion dollars. Now they take the billion dollars and they buy back the stock. And maybe it causes the stock to go up a little bit. But then, when I'm sitting there as a stockholder, I still own 10% afterwards, right? Maybe I own only, because they bought back some of the stock, maybe I own... They bought 10, let's say they bought 10% of the stock, so I own only 9.9% .9 of the stock now. But I also have a billion dollars less. So my stock represents the company smaller. So why would the stock price go up? And it doesn't. Stock buybacks by themselves do not raise the price of stocks. And I'll do a show on stock buybacks. I'll try to, I'll try to illustrate with some numbers and try to illustrate uh, with more details. All right, um, I am gonna call it a night. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. It seems like I take these short little clips and I talk for an hour about them. Now I did take a break there, but I talked for an hour about them, which is, uh, uh, which is longer than I expect. So I'm not gonna talk about Jordan Peterson tonight. I'll do it on Wednesday. Um, I'll talk about it then. So uh, again, I, what I'm trying to illustrate, illustrate is the sheer ignorance of people on the left of economics. And I could do, unfortunately, I could do the same thing. Less so, the people on the right tend to have a better understanding of economics. Still ignorant, but better. What we need today, what I call the new intellectual, would be any man or woman who is willing to think. Meaning, any man or woman who knows that man's life must be guided by reason, by the intellect, not by feelings, wishes, whims, or mystic revelations. Any man or woman who values his life and who does not give, want to give in to today's cult of despair, cynicism, and impotence, and does not intend to give up the world to the dark ages and to the rule of the collectivist brutes.